We're in a series called Stories. We're telling stories of our lives, test, uh, testimonies as they call it. Uh, last week, uh, Adam shared some story about his life. I want to thank you for being so open and honest and uh, with it. that story. That was awesome. Uh, we appreciate that. And uh, so it's, it's, today they told me to tell my story. And, and, and part of this story you guys have heard before, but a lot of it you haven't. So uh, first of all, I got to tell you right off the bat, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. Uh, I lived a life that's just been amazing. Um, okay, it wasn't all good. Uh, when I was a kid, one of the first memories I have of my mom is, is her waking me up and me looking up and her hair was all frizzed out like a witch and she had smeared ashes all over her face and she said, mommy's going away. And uh, they took her away to wherever they take people that have nervous breakdowns. But, but she came back and uh, some years later when I was uh, maybe seven years old, uh, I opened the refrigerator and there was cake in there. And I was like, oh, cake, that's a great cake. And my mom said, no, you won't like that. That's a rum cake. That's my wedding cake. And I was like, Whoa? That didn't make sense. What about daddy? I thought you guys were already married. Well, apparently they had been married, unmarried, and she had been remarried, and I never knew any of that. Um, so that wasn't all that great. My dad, he took me aside at that point, and I remember sitting in the car with him and turn, him turning to me and saying, you're not my kid anymore. You belong to Reed now. Reed, I guess, was the name of the guy that she was marrying and, or had married. And he said, so get out of the car. And I got out, and he drove away. Now... I did see him again. Uh, when I was 29, I looked him up, found out where he lived, knocked on his door. He opened the door, and I said, I'm Rory. And he went, oh, well, are you going to come in? I recognized his voice, interesting, but nothing else about him. But I went in, and we talked for a few hours. And you know what? He was not a nice guy, not a nice person. He turned to me at one point and said, you walked out on me when you were six years old. I was like, But then again, luckily, I knew that it was probably a good thing that I didn't have to live with that guy all my life. So, hey, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. The guy my mom married was named Roger. He was a fisherman, uh, fisher hunter, you know, type of guy. Um, no relationship. We didn't have any relationship whatsoever, so to speak, because I wasn't into any of that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, honestly, I never heard the words, I love you from a male until I joined a church. It went well into my adulthood. I was a loner as a kid, and not by choice. <laughs> the other kids just didn't seem to like me. Um, I got bullied a lot, and uh, so I joined the Boy Scouts, where I got bullied. <laughs> they would sit, pin me to the floor, you know, knees on my shoulders, and feed me grass. Those are the kind of things I remember from Boy Scouts. But I did have a great scoutmaster, George. George was a uh, boy-loving a man, and he would take me out on special camp outs, just the two of us. And when I say boy loving man. So, um, you know what? That wasn't so bad. Actually, I was rather uh, grateful for the attention because apparently he liked me, and apparently nobody else did. So, uh, I, we weren't allowed to watch TV in our house. Uh, uh, I have two sisters, one's five years older, one's one year older. Dinner time was a little weird at our house. The food all had to be passed in one direction. I had to go clockwise. You couldn't pass it the other way. Uh, my dad, my stepdad, a man, you know, one time he picked up a fork and chucked it across the room and bounced off the wall and he said, this fork is dull. I'm like, a dull fork? What is the deal with that? Once you sat down at the dinner table, you weren't allowed to get up. You know, so if the person in charge of setting the table hadn't put drinks out and you were having a chili or something spicy, too bad. And, and dinner was used as a time to quiz the kids about, you know, modern events. The Vietnam War was going on. I'll bet you don't even know where Vietnam is. Do you? All right, get upstairs. There's an encyclopedia up there. Don't come back down until you know and can show me where Vietnam is. He, uh, he drank a lot. Um, just beer, as far as I recall. I don't know that he ever drank hard liquor, he just, but he had a beer all the time. He drove with a long neck beer between his legs. As I just uh, always had a beer, I, I, but I never saw him drunk, as far as I know, um, or maybe I never saw him not drunk and didn't know the difference. <laughs> I'm not sure which. <laughs> but he never appeared to be drunk, but, but he drank all the time. My mom was a wine drinker, on the other hand, not just wine, because I remember 
one day I opened up the refrigerator and there was this pitcher of ice water there and I poured myself a glass and choom, and it was like, you know what, it was vodka. And for a 10-year-old kid, that's a shocker, Rooney. And my stepdad also smoked all the time, chain smoker one after the other. He died when he was 48 from cancer. Both my sisters got into drugs. Uh, my older sister moved out as soon as she could possibly get out of the house. So by the time I was 13, she was gone. But I got out of the house, too, uh, when I could, and especially during the summers. You know, we had a summer uh, stock theater uh, company and uh, was, wasn't too far, uh, maybe eight, nine m uh, miles away at a, one of the colleges. And um, I grew up in Amherst, Massachusetts. Uh, there were five colleges, Mount Holyoke College, Smith College, Amherst College, University of Massachusetts, Hampshire College. They were all within uh, a very, very short radius. So I hung out at the colleges, and I would go there for the summers. I did three years of that. It was the greatest summers of my life. Had a great time, um, just to not be at home, really. Uh, but here's an interesting story about summer theater. Summer theater, you worked uh, from 8 in the morning until 11 at night, every day, and seven, uh, six days a week. And then on Sundays, we had off. And uh, you... So on Sunday, everybody slept in. Well, one Sunday, I woke up, you know, and I just couldn't go back to sleep. And I had this, I had this absolute urge that I had to go home, a nagging urge. There's nothing for me at home. Trust me, I, I was there to escape from being at home, but I just couldn't get rid of it. So I got up, and I went out, and, uh, did, you know, and I hitchhiked back to, back to Amherst. I was in a whole different town, and, and finally caught a ride. And then I walked the last, you know, two miles because we didn't live near any kind of a major street. And... And I walked in the house, and, and my stepdad was there with a shotgun and was about to kill himself. And um, he was upset because he had gotten the bill in the mail for my sister's abortion. And that's how he found out that she had one. And he was very upset about that. And, uh, and uh, so, but, but the thing was, he and I sat down and we talked for the very first time. In fact, the only time, actually, ever, <laughs> before or after. But... That day, I talked him down. And that, so you talk about lucky. That was lucky. Uh, my 15th birthday, my parents got a, uh, they got a new TV, so I got the old one, big one of those huge old black and white jobs. I put it up in my bedroom, and that was a lifesaver because I spent, from the day I, time I got out of school until nighttime in my room just watching TV. Watching, watching TV, TV, TV. It's the equivalent today of the kid that gets home, puts on the head, so stands in front of the video game and plays all day long. I mean, if we'd had video games in those days, I'd have been that guy. But I was a TV guy or a magic guy. I would stay in my room and practice magic all day long because by then I was into magic and, and doing that. So just hours and hours and hours locked up in my room with TV or magic. And uh, one day I came home from the movies and uh, I just walked in and there was a party going on. There was music playing like Steppenwolf, not the kind of music my dad would play. He was a Johnny Cash kind of guy. And uh, there was mu uh, incense burning, not the kind of stuff you'd have in my house with my dad around. And I'm like, what is going on? There's college students everywhere. And I'm like, what is happening? And I walked in and my mom said, we're having a party. Your dad left. Well, yeah, my dad left when I was six or seven. But this guy, he had left too, my stepdad. And I remember sitting there thinking, and you're having a party? Your marriage just broke up? You're getting a divorce and you're having a party? I just turned around and walked out of the house and didn't come back that night. I didn't have to come back. So that was a cool thing about me as a kid. One of the lucky things I had was I, I, nobody really cared about what I did. I could walk out of the house and not come back for three days and nobody ever knew why I was gone. My friends were like, that is great, man. You are the luckiest guy in the world. Truth is, of course, you know, when nobody cares if you live or die, it's not cool. It doesn't make you feel good at that age. But uh, my mom had gone full hippie at that point, you know, flowers in the head, 19-year-old boyfriend. She was 45 going on 16, which means that I had to be 16 going on 45. It was up to me to, to take over the house and, you know, make sure things were happening right and together and... and and, uh, you know, I didn't have to do stuff like parties in high school. <laughs> My wife and I were watching a movie just like three, four nights ago. And it was one of those typical teen comedies. And, and you know, where the, all the teenagers are at some 
kid's house and there's people doing beer pong and everybody's, you know, and they're getting crazy and jumping in the pool and stuff. And I turned around and I said, that is so far from reality as far as I can tell. I never had anything remotely similar to that in my life. I don't recall ever going to a party in high school or even knowing that they existed. I was a loner. I came home one night, uh, and I said, um, I had been away for a while because I got out of school early. Um, I, I mean, I did, completed all my school, and then I got out six months early and joined the circus. And I, and I uh, ran away with the circus. I didn't really run away. My mom said, go. <laughs> so I, I went and joined the circus. But sometime after that, I came home, and, and I, I remember saying, hey, I graduated high school today. My mom's latest, you know, 18-year-old boyfriend went, cool. And my mom didn't say a word. She just, you know, nothing. And I thought, some kids get a car. Just, you know, just a hello, good job would have been nice. But um, so I went, to the, I went to my graduation. But see, we were on the free school lunch program and the, you know, the food stamp thing. And, and so when I got to my mom and said I needed $30 for a, a gown to graduate in, they charged you for those, and, and uh, I wouldn't, the answer was no. So, so I did not go up on the stage and, and do the graduation with my class. I, I sat in the audience with everybody else who watched it. But I didn't have to get up there in that hot gown, man, and sweat it out like I heard later that it was just horrible. So hey, lucky me. Now all of this might seem like it was hurtful to me, but did it bother me? No, not that you could tell. See, I learned I could do a remarkable thing. I learned I could turn off my feelings. I had this weird trick I did, it's just awesome. It's just, I could do this thing where I could go and feel nothing. It was, it was a really cool defensive mechanism. See, my job was not to take care of me. My job was to take care of others. I'd been trained from that at a very early age. So, like, you know, when, the, when Raj and Mom finally did break up, I got caught in the middle. You know, he would say, tell your mother this. She's calling me up and she's driving me nuts. And, da, 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 da. and she would say, tell Roger this. And then I'm like, I'm in the middle. Look at that. I'm the kid. But I never said that. That's just what I thought. And uh, my mom was bipolar and not on any kind of medication. So... She often got into uh, suicidal uh, moods. And my sister would wind her up and just drive her to the edge of wanting to kill herself. And I never got that. I did not like my sister. And, um, and that was my job to talk her down whenever she got like that. Well, I, of course, it was my job. I was the only other person in the house with her. My other sister was gone by then as well. And, and um, I found that humor became my weapon. Because if I get my mom to laugh, it would break the moment, and then we'd be okay. And uh, the humor is, it served me very, very well, because later on in life, I got to be a comedian and was quite successful at it. See, so hey, luckiest guy in the world. 17, I met a college girl. She needed me, and I needed to be needed. And uh, she was in uh, three, three, three years older than, well, she was at Mount Holyoke College, and she was in college, struggling with college, and it's a really tough college, and, and so I was there for her. I was her cheerleader. I was, helped her. I was there, you know, to, and I got her through college, and she graduated, and it was great, and then we moved in together. No sex. Not because I was morally pure in any way, just because that was her rule. No sex. And if you were going to have sex, you had to be married. Okay, that made sense, so uh, like the month after I turned 20 years old, we got married. And then the rule was, no sex. I know. I laughed too. <laughs> Turns out uh, that that had been an excuse, not being married for no sex at that, up till that point. That wasn't really her reason. Her reason was that she had lost her virginity through a rape. And sex she had no interest in. Unless, as it turns out, it was with another woman, or apparently with another guy who wasn't me. That marriage was over pretty quick. Six months, gotta be some kind of a record. But 
Lucky me, I moved in immediately with another woman because I wanted to be wanted. She needed taken care of. Perfect. Now, you guys heard the word codependency, the term codependency? All right, in case you're not familiar with it, let me explain what codependency is. Codependency is one of those things that they talk about in addiction places. You know, you got alcoholism, uh, drugs, uh, overeating, gambling, uh, sex. Uh, codependency is one of those. Codependency is um, when you depend on other people for your self-worth. All the feeling that you get, the happiness that you have comes from making other people happy and how they feel about you. If they're happy, you're happy. That's codependency. I was, I was extremely codependent because that's, as far as I knew, that was my job was to take care of other people. And if they were happy, then I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. My, my, uh, my new girlfriend, on the other hand, uh, she was not codependent. She was dependent on me. And um, she wanted nothing to, in life to be, but to be with me. I said, don't you have any dreams, any aspirations, anything you want to do? No, just want to be with you. That's a lot of pressure on a codependent guy. So I was, she was looking at me to make her happy. And, and, and the other thing about her that was interesting was that she didn't care how I felt about anything or what, or what I was going through whatsoever. It was all about her. And so for me to try and get something out of the relationship, I had to make her happy. It was very, very difficult. She had that... Same motto as Popeye does. I am what I am. Take it or leave it. And that, that was a lot of pressure. So I, I went back to my old escape defense mechanisms like I did in high school where I had to go, you know, I had to watch TV all the time. I started going to the movies. And I went to the movies all the time. I mean, just all the time. I see three movies in a day sometimes. There, there was a one year that I saw every movie that came out, literally every movie that was released that year. And, uh, and, and then I was able to go to classes during the day, acting classes, writing classes, martial arts classes, anything to just, you know, be out there and not thinking about things. And at night, I was performing. I was doing my magic act on stages around uh, the Los Angeles area, and, and that was a good thing because I got all my validation at that point from being on stage, everything. You know, I was totally, everything was about what the audience, you know, the audience liked me, and that was great. Of course, a bad review or a messed up show was devastating. Also, as a young actor, I was doing a, a lot of acting classes. As a young actor, I had a problem, and that was I couldn't feel. I couldn't cry. I couldn't be angry. I couldn't feel because I had learned to turn off that. And I had buried it so deep. I had buried my emotions in a, in a, in a safe, in a vault, that was in a fortress that was surrounded by alligators that had electric fences. I mean, you could not get to my emotions. They were gone, buried. I couldn't tap them, and I had to learn to do that to be an actor. Because if you're an actor and you can't, if you can't feel real, real emotion, the audience knows it. It knows it's fake, and you're useless as an actor. So I had to learn how to feel again. And I worked on that very, very hard. I got naked. Literally, one time in this very weird class that I don't want to talk about. <laughs> better, better forgotten. <laughs> but, I, but I learned. I learned to get back in touch with my emotions. And, the, and that's great. But the problem was, once released, you can't lock them up again. Which is okay, but I couldn't control them. And I was completely overwhelmed. And... And one night, I stood up in the middle of the night, I got out of bed, I stood in the middle of the bedroom, and I screamed, what about me? What about me? My wife, who was in bed, was going. <laughs> and I went off to Lake Tahoe to star in a magic show, or a show there, I was the magician in the show, and my wife wouldn't come with me. She's like, no, you just go, you just go. And that was annoying, but lucky me, luckiest guy in the world, lucky me there was other women there who were interested in me. And around then is the first time uh, I, I had my first infidelity as a married man. And boy, did I feel guilty. I was overwhelmed with guilt. 
Lucky for me, the second time was easier. The third time is easier than that. The fourth time is easier than that. And fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, then it gets real easy. About that same time also, I started to drink. 25 years old, if you're trying to keep track of, of where we are at this point. And uh, drinking for me was a means to an end because I wasn't accepted in the group of people. They were performing in this show together, all these people, and, and uh, nobody, they were drinking, they were doing drugs. I didn't drink, I didn't do drugs. I wasn't accepted into the group. And the day came when I was sitting at the bar after the show with the band, and one of the guys in the band turned to me and said, big star, too big to drink with the band. And I was like, no, 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 that, that just so hurt me that they would think that. I said, no, 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 buy me a drink. And that, that was my first drink. And I kept drinking them. Because the idea was to blend in with people, to, to make friends. It's the same reason I started doing drugs when the time came, because I wanted people to like me. And me being the luckiest guy in the world, there was always plenty of women and liquor and drugs around in those days for a popular entertainer. And luckily for me, when my second wife had an affair, hey, it's okay, I, I was, <laughs> I'd done it. I understood, so how could I be mad at her? That was lucky. And when that second marriage ended, I, at least I could say to myself, well, lucky you, 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 you know, you, you've only failed at two marriages. Unlike your mom, who's on number six now, lucky you. Now, you may be catching a bit of sarcasm in this luckiest guy in the world stuff, but there's a truth to it as well. Why? Because of what happened to me when I was in my early 30s. Now, a lot of you have heard this part. Some of you just like eight weeks ago, and I'm sorry to run through it again, but there's some people here that haven't heard it, and it is so much a part of who I am today that I have to, if I'm going to tell my story, I have to tell it again. I was an atheist. Yeah, my mom made us go to church, uh, but it was boring, and it was stupid, and, and I stopped going as soon as I was able to stop going, because religion didn't make sense. Not any more than... God didn't make sense more than Zeus or Odin or Apollo made sense. It was all the same kind of a God thing. There were more atrocities named, done in the name of God than anything else. People were persecuted and, and tortured and slaughtered. It didn't make sense. Every religion claimed that they were the one and only true religion, and, and, and that was absolutely positively they were sure of that. That didn't make sense. Various variations of the same religion didn't agree with each other. Protestants and Presbyterians and Lutherans and Baptists and Congregationalists and... And, and variations like Jehovah's Witnesses or Latter-day Saints. I mean, the, the, the Protestants and the Catholics have been killing each other for centuries. Supposedly, the same God. It, it didn't make sense. And I saw how people acted, the hypocrisy of it. They go to church, and then they'd be bigoted against people who didn't look like them or didn't think like them. Or they'd shake their reverend's hand and say, what a wonderful Wonderful, wonderful message today, Reverend. And then they go home and get drunk and beat up their wives. It didn't make sense. And the reasons in my head just went on and on and on. And besides all that, like I said to you, I thought church was irrelevant. I mean, what, did I, what those people 2,000 years ago went through, what, what did that have to do with me? And I was a magician. You know, I knew the psychology of making people believe in things that weren't real. I was good at it. So the thing was, even if I wanted to believe, and there were moments that I did, but even if I did, I couldn't. I just couldn't. The, the only way that Rory Johnson was going to believe that there was a God was if God himself came down and like poof, right there in front of me, came down to earth and was there in front of me. And that's what happened. Most people take God's existence on faith. I don't really, I know. Late one night in the bedroom of my little apartment, I found myself in the presence of God. Now, don't ask me to describe him. He's not an old man with long hair or beard or anything. It's just, he's not a physical being at all. He was just a presence. Uh, he is this overwhelming presence. He's, he's, he was everything. 
all, all emotions, all senses, all memories, all history, everything was right there. And I dropped to my knees. Not because I'd been taught to do it in church, but because when you were in the presence of God, it's just what happens. I was immediately overcome with deep shame and sorrow, and I hung my head down, and tears came down my face, and all I could say was, I'm sorry. I am so, so sorry. And I wasn't apologizing just for me. I was apologizing for all of us, everyone. Because I knew in my heart that moment, it just the, the, I knew that every person on this planet is connected. We are all one. And I felt terrible about the way we treated each other and the animals and the very earth itself. I felt shame. I felt like a kid who had been given something just irreplaceable, and then had messed with it and had broken it somehow. And I, I didn't feel that God was angry at me, but maybe a, disappointed, and I didn't want to be disappointing to him. But most of all, I felt love. In spite of the ultimately disappointing, totally unworthy creature I was, I felt overwhelming, uncompromising, unconditional, all-encompassing love for the first time in my life. And forgiveness. <clears throat> and I knew at that moment that everything I had done in the past was done and forgotten and put aside and forgiven and it didn't count anymore. And what counted from this moment on was where I went from here. It was like I had been wandering on this path, lost, and he had picked me up and put me back on the right path and said, now it's up to you to choose. You're going to walk on this path. And the truth is, once you've been in the presence of God, any other choice is crazy. So in that instant, I was utterly transformed into the perfect Christian. <laughs> oh, boy, wouldn't it be great if you could say that and it'd be actually the real story? But no, no way, that did not happen because, like, the next day, I would just refuse to, I didn't want to believe what had happened. I thought, maybe it's a dream. I knew it was, and maybe somebody slipped me drugs. I knew they hadn't. Maybe my, I'd gone psychotic. I had a psychotic breakdown and saw something in there, but I knew that it was real. And... I didn't want to admit it. Like a kid with a smelly, torn, old, icky security blanket, I didn't want to let go of my earlier convictions. Why? Because when you'd been denying the existence of somebody your entire life, to admit that you were wrong is embarrassing. It's hard. But I found myself with this huge problem, and the problem was this. Before that night, I could not, no matter what, no matter how hard or how much I wanted it, I could not believe that there was a God. But after that night, I could not believe there was not a God. I knew he was real. And then I met, uh, I met a new woman um, who was a Christian, and she was somebody that I finally cared about, somebody enough to listen to what they had to say about it all, to really listen. And then I had a best friend, uh, Pete, and during this time when I was doing bad things, uh, I did something to my best friend, Pete, who most people would say was unforgivable. And he called me up one day night, one night, and, and he said, um, I need to talk to you. Meet me at the uh, Mexican restaurant down the street from your house. And I was actually, I knew exactly what he wanted to talk about. And I was glad he said, meet me in a restaurant so he couldn't kill me. And I met him there. And I sat down, and he did not hesitate for a moment. He didn't make me sit and squirm. The first thing he said immediately was, I know it. I want you to know that I know what you did. 
And I want you to know, I forgive you. That moment changed my life. Because for the first time I thought, wow, you really can walk the walk. Because he was a Christian. And I thought, here he is in the, the, the most difficult possible moment doing what Jesus said to do. I guess it, I guess it can be done. And that was life-changing. And so, with the help of a very good woman and a good, good friend, I, uh, I was able to humble myself and, and admit something that I've never been able to admit myself before that. And that was that maybe, just maybe, I wasn't the smartest guy on the planet. And maybe, just maybe, there was people that knew things that I didn't know. And the moment that I accepted that, it's the moment I was able to open myself up to the truth. Hallelujah. Now, there's more to my little story uh, there. And some of you have heard it, some of you haven't. And if you want to hear it, that'd be great. I'm happy to tell it to you. But to make a long story short, <laughs> too late. I went from Adam and atheist to fully devoted follower of Christ. Hallelujah. When you know God, not just know about Him, but know Him, everything changes. All those horrible things that happened to me, horrible, suddenly had a reason. And a, and a meaning that went well beyond the pain. And I became the luckiest guy in the world. Romans 8.28 says, We know that in everything God works for the good of those who love him. They are the people he called because this was his plan. Do you see that word? In everything. Even the things that seem bad. The song we were just singing said, When God does his thing, you see things differently. God had a plan for me all along. And why would he wait for me till I was in my 30s in order to, <laughs> before letting me know, that, you know that, that he was real? Well, I don't presume to know what God was thinking or anything, but I thought to myself, well, maybe he just got tired of waiting. You know, maybe he looked down and said, that boy is just so stubborn and stupid he ain't going to get it on his own. I'm just going to have to go down there. But he did. And I became the luckiest guy in the world because now all of that bad worked for good. The lonely, bullied, abused kid developed a compassion for those that are lonely, bullied, and abused. That broken marriages, you know, both my parents and my own, they give me a love for people that are struggling in their marriages. Living a significant part of your formative years with nobody seeming to care if you're alive or dead gives you a fierce sense of independence. The martial arts, when I started because I was bullied and I was tired of that, that, that got me into good conditions, all those lessons. And because I had a good sense, I, I learned that I didn't need to fight. And it takes away the fear, which opens up the world. All that theater and TV and movies and music that I escaped into and magic that led me into a deep love for the arts, which served me well in a very successful career, writing, acting, directing, and doing magic. Also got me connected to a great church through a theater ministry. And man, when you get connected to a great church, everything changes. That changed my life. Even more, it introduced me to other people who were walking the walk, and now we could walk the walk together and do that hike side by side. And sometimes it is a hike. I discovered I didn't need to be on stage performing in order to feel comfortable or be in control. I discovered I didn't need alcohol or drugs or sex to feel alive or to get people to like me. I realized those were false feelings, and those were the wrong people. Peer pressure had no more control over me. My self-worth came 
from a much more powerful source. Even being an atheist has its upside, you know, because being a non-believer gave me insight into the way non-believers speak. If so many people walk into this church and they are a non-believer, they don't get it yet, or they even they're an atheist. I get it. I can relate to that person. I mean, I really get it. I don't just, you know, unlike somebody that was maybe raised in the church all their life. I get it. Been there. Done that. And hating the church because it was boring and irrelevant, that gives me motivation to make this church a place where even the first-time guests can feel welcome and interested and see how it relates to their life and maybe even motivated. And that codependency, that need to take care of others, never went away. But now, it's not because I get my self-worth from what others think of me, but it's because I'm filled with God's compassion, which allows me to love even those who are not so lovable. It led me to become a shepherd, to work as a pastor, to work as a pastor for the Las Vegas Rescue Mission, to do what I do now, working with respite. For those of you who don't know my day job, I work for, respite, uh, I work for a, a hospice company. You know, I help people out that are dying and passing on and help them and their families make, make that transition. That's what I do all day, family to family to family to person to person to person. Turns out that feeling of wanting to help others that God built into me wasn't a bad thing. It was a way I was trying to fulfill that that was bad. My choice, bad. His plan, perfect. But I had to know him to understand that. So now maybe you're beginning to see why I truly am one of the luckiest guys in the world. And I need you to understand I'm not being facetious when I say that. I have lived an amazing life. I, I have an incredible career, a wonderful marriage. I, I have a, 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 bl a blessed life in the church. I have a manuscript at home. It's titled Grateful. And it is a list of all sort of, you know, all the great things that have happened to me in my life. And as a contrast to, uh, you know, the way this whole thing started, I'd like to read you that list. But I can't because it would take way too long. Because I'm the luckiest guy in the world. So why am I telling you all this? Well, first and foremost, I want you to know something. I want you to know that God is real. There is a God who loves you unconditionally. I've been in his presence. And I'm standing before you to tell you he is real. He has a plan for you. It may feel to you like he's not there, like he's an absentee father or something, but trust me, he's there. You know, I never saw it at the time. It never even occurred to me, but you remember I told you about that time I left summer theater because I just felt compelled to go home and I walked in and, 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 and saved my stepdad's life? Who do you think was putting that compulsion into me? I'm pretty sure he's there. He's always been there. He'll always be there. And I'm also telling you this because if you're in that place that I was for so many years, that doubtful, lonely, struggling, hurtful place, I'm hoping that my words today give you permission to allow yourself to begin the search for that missing truth. And I want you to know it's okay to admit that you don't know everything and that maybe there are people that might know things that you don't know and to open your heart to the possibilities that there just might be more to this world than you had imagined and as Jesus said the truth will set you free when I shouted that question that one night what about me? God answered. And I ask you the same question. What about you? And when you find the answer to that question, you may just become one of the luckiest people in the world. Let's pray. Father God, 
on this Father's Day. I'm so grateful that you are a Father that is so loving and that we can come to. Thank you for all the things that happen to us that are part of your plan to grow us, to turn us into the person you want us to be. And although it may be difficult at the time, help us understand that there is a reason for these very difficult weeks that people go through sometimes. And not to give up, but to connect with you. I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. If you have something going on in your life that you're struggling with, you want to talk to somebody about it, we have a prayer team down here. And afterwards, just come on up and and talk to some of these people, and they'll pray for you. And if you're on that search, ask, talk, question. I'd love to talk to you. And if today's the day that you think that maybe it's time for you to say, okay, I will make that change. I will understand that God is real. I will accept Jesus as my Savior. Oh, please come forward afterwards and we will help you with that. And if you're a father, remember, there's nothing more important than spending time with your kids, caring about them. The best thing you can do for them also is to be loving to your wife. And join us, because we're about to have some hot dogs and uh, donuts, perfect dad food. (laughs) Have a good week, everybody. We'll see you out there.